Okay, thanks Deirdre. So we've one more session to the lunch break. So uh, added value opportunities, you've heard a lot about it and our next three speakers are hopefully going to give us uh, some unique insight into the exciting work that's underway both in Oak Park, Moor Park and with our uh, partners in SETU as well. So first up uh, I'd like to invite Mark Fenlon who's going to give us an overview of some of the ongoing research. Thanks, Ewan. Um, so as Ewan said, I'm going to give you a quick overview of where we are in both Chagas and the research community, I suppose, in general, and also give you some industry examples of where we are with value add in this space. And there's an interesting one at the very end, of it, which is directly related to, to this conference. Um, I suppose just to set the scene, in the food programme, we've been looking at a total food systems approach, which means we take right the way through to production, all the way through to finished ingredients, and all the way through to uh, digestion and so on. But the only point that's really relevant for he here today is the point number three, which is alternative ingredients made from plant and crops, grains and legumes. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on, uh, the value add there. Uh, we have made a lot of investment at both the Ashtown in Dublin and Moor Park, uh, particularly in the fermentation space. So I'll, I'll touch on that later and where that comes into the, into the mix. Two projects really at the core of this. One is Uprotein, led by myself, which is a Department of Agriculture funded one. Five Chagas centres involved, including our colleagues here uh, at Oak Park, um, and also five universities involved in that and a number of industries as well. So the type of industries then range from everything from seed crop people, uh, producers all the way through to the likes of PepsiCo and so on. Um, the second one then is the Valpro project as well, which Ewan is coordinating, so that's the other project that, that it's based on. I promise I've only one dairy slide, but there is a reason why it's up here, um, before I get myself in trouble. The, you're starting with milk, and a lot of people think, it, it, you must remember we export 90% of, of, our, of our food, and most of it is exported as, as ingredients. So we can't export milk to faraway markets, so we have to turn it into ingredients, particularly dried ingredients. So these are the type of things then that comes out of milk. We're talking about fortified liquid milks, whey protein isolates, etc., all the way up. So you're moving up the value chain here. So the dairy industry's been at this for the last 40, 50 years, and it's led mainly through the development of membrane technology, giant technologies, and so on and so on. So the relevance to here, which the rest of my presentation on is, can we do this with plant and crops and cereals? That's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, okay, I'm not expecting you to read this on the side, but it just shows you, if you look at the very bottom is milk, some of the ingredients that come out of milk today. So these are uh, shipped all around the world. We don't make all of these in Ireland, but we make a lot. Uh, different whey ingredients and so on. And you would be familiar with the comment that the whey is worth more than the cheese now, and, and that is true. So remember, cheese produces whey, that produced into a lot of different ingredients. So the dairy industry has been very good at valorizing this. Okay, so that brings us to our, to the spec to the cereals then. Um, this is you protein, so we go from six tasks. Uh, the one we're interested here is task three, which is the protein processing. So can we take protein out of plants or cereals, but can we valorize, and this is the key thing, can we valorize the rest of it, and not just throw it away or use it for animal feed and so on, but can we take the starch, can we take the fiber, can we upcycle all the different parts of a plant the same way that's done with a dairy? The obvious first thing is that liquid, milk is liquid, plants are not, so there is an issue up front, but the technology has evolved now to do this. So we're looking at novel protein ingredient products, digestibility score, uh, et cetera, land use models, and LCA, and we work with the rest of the colleagues in Chagas on this. So this is what we've done. Uh, we have developed the process at Moor Park and at Ashtown. We've developed a new process which we can uh, suc successfully do that. So we can fractionate different plants. Uh, we have looked at optimizing this, and we've also looked at the effect of the process and the functionality of the ingredients. Remember, we're talking about ingredients here. So the ingredient has to rehydrate somewhere else in the world. It has to be a nutritional base for someone else to build a product on. And that's what we do with skim milk powder and so on. But can you use plant proteins to do that? The answer is yes, you can. Um, so we have been working in this uh, uh, down in Moor Park, using, a lot, in a lot of cases, the same equipment that's used for dairy. Um, so in case anyone is interested, we have a review on it, which was published in 2023, um, and there's another paper coming out this year, which is on the fava bean protein, etc. So these are down, there's um, uh, uh, one of the uh, presentations here, one of the boots here, has, has, these are there. So just to show you maybe the top one there, which is the fava bean protein isolate, so that's 90% protein. Uh, ingredient, which can be used in nutritional beverages and so on, and high-end value products. So we successfully made that at Moor Park. 
But again, the key is not to dis disregard the rest of the products. So the, the, take the protein out, but we also need to take the starch, and we also need to take the fiber. All be them commodities, but when you put the whole lot together, the business model uh, is much more favorable than just taking the protein alone. So that means using the dehulls the de -hulls of it as well, and also and, uh, any other fractions that we get out of the process doing this. And there's a loop and protein, uh, there's a loop and flour out there as well, and we've also done chickpea. We've done a lot of tubers, different types of tubers. We work with a company called Biotanics in Kilkenny, and we get unusual types of tubers and so on as well there. So again, it's about fractionation into ingredients. Um, and this, this here, the beverage you see on the top here is a beverage that's made with fava lupin and pea protein isolate. So this is a key thing because we successfully were able to make a, a beverage which we put in fat, we put in a different carbohydrate, uh, so we can make that and use the protein from the plant proteins to successfully create the emulsion there and it's stable. What I mean by stable is when you homogenize milk, it doesn't separate anymore. You're, uh, and that's the dairy protein that does that. But the plant protein, while processed correctly, can do the same thing. So just to show that that can actually, that's successful there. And we're working with a number of uh, multinational companies in this space. We also have a new drying technology here uh, for drying uh, fiber and so on. So again, we couldn't dry that before. You can't put that through a spray dryer. So we can, we can dry that now in Moor Park as well. Um, I won't labor on this slide, but the, I mean, biotransformation is a fancy name for fermentation. Um, at the end of the day, you can produce some really high-end ingredients. In this case, it's beta-carotene, uh, the precursor for vitamin A. So again, this is from using uh, residue from tubers. So I have two slides left, uh, and, and these are probably most relevant. Just to show you what's going on in the world in this space, um, so we can, we, can, we can do this in Ireland. We, we have the technology at a laboratory level for doing it, just to clarify. Um, but Friesland Campina has launched Plant Protein, and this is a dairy company. Um, we have another Dutch consortium here. Benio has more. But this one here, uh, Nutris, in 2022, they opened a plant in Croatia where fava beans and potatoes can come in and they can fractionate it into protein, starch, and fiber. So they say it's the first one in the world, or in Europe anyway, to do this. So they've essentially done um, what's something which we would think is, is, is quite interesting. So the farmers get paid... Uh, um, you know, a contract for going to fava beans, then it's going and it's processed, uh, like you would do with, uh, with milk in this case. Um, so we didn't know this was here when we started out the project, uh, but we don't know even if, if it's been successful, and you can Google that yourself and see how it's going, but we're just to show that, uh, that it has been done at that scale. And we did, this, we did talk to the equipment suppliers um, on this, and to be honest, it doesn't need too much more equipment other than what we have already in the country, uh, but there is equipment needed, particularly on the starch side and the fibre side. But you can develop a process, which we have developed, to do a similar thing. Um, this is another interesting one. Um, this is myself and my colleagues, John and Laura, we're over in St. Louis in the Budweiser plant. Uh, and you'd say, why are the dairy people over there? Um, what they've done here is, if you take the dry matter content of barley, it's about 11%, I think, roughly. Am I right, John? So, uh, of dry matter. But when you put that into a brewing process, um, <clears throat> the first thing you do is produce a brewer's spread grain. The carbohydrate component goes to make your alcohol. So you've already made a valuable source here, which is, we all know, Budweiser, Cellartois, and so on, are these companies. The Sennhauser Bauscher, the company who, who behind this. Um, <clears throat> that's their brewing plant there you see in the picture. But the brewer's spread grain now has gone from, is up 32% protein. So that's what, you know, traditionally has been fed to the animals. I, guess, I think that's what we do here in Ireland as well, or a certain amount of it. But they have built a 200 million euro plant where they're extracting the protein out of that. And we're working on that with them in Moorpark. Um, but the real interesting part is that the other reason they're talking to us is that the processing technology is similar to dairy. Not all of it, but some of it. So it's a very interesting uh, story. It's the first one that I know in the world. But the other interesting thing is you're that elite plant protein there, uh, that plant protein, um, and I think if you look at the Netflix um, Game Changers, I think it is, um, they actually use and, and, uh, uh, some of this. So the point is, if you Google that, you'll see it's elite plant protein. So it's basically upcycling your barley protein. So now where you would have had brewing uh, in the past, the brewers now, uh, and this is probably the first company I think that, that has, it has completed this, is now doing what the cheese in the whey story, the beer and the protein story as well. So I think they're taking, and they tell me there's over 9 million metric tons of brewer's grain in the world. That's, nine, that's about three, 3 million metric tons of protein. So there's a lot of this in the world. 
So the point is, as it added value, and it's the same processing technologies and the same ingredient technology that we're working on uh, in the likes of Moore Park and Ashdown. So I think it's an interesting story, and it upcycles, and also from a sustainability point of view is very important. Um, that, that is the poster that's outside, so maybe uh, Richard Lynch, my colleague, is down there, uh, and you and myself are there as well. So if you want to go down there, um, some of the isolates and so on are, are down there. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, Mark, if you can join me over here while uh, John is next up. So we've heard an awful lot about life cycle analysis and carbon footprinting. So John hopefully is going to give us some insights into recent work being done between Chagosk and, uh, and our commercial partners. Yeah, thanks, Ewan. Uh, just point out, uh, two of my colleagues, Donald O'Brien and Gary Lanigan, both from uh, Johnstown Castle, had a huge input into this. Uh, Donald probably had the biggest input, and he's here hiding in the audience somewhere, so if you have any very difficult questions, uh, ask him at lunchtime. Okay, so uh, Mark mentioned life cycle analysis of these ingredients. Obviously, the first thing you've got to do is get an accurate carbon footprint, for want of a better description, of the crop that you're going to process, and that's what we've been uh, developing over recent months. So just to point out that there are two carbon accounting methods, and people often get confused between them. They have what are called different system boundaries, so different things are included in them. The first one is uh, the, the IPCC, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Approach, and that's what's used for the national inventory, uh, you know, for, for calculating Ireland, Ireland's emissions. And the second one is the life cycle assessment, or LCA, and that's used to, to calculate the carbon footprint of a product. And it's per kilogram of, of uh, grain or per litre of milk or a kilo of meat or whatever you want. But it's, a, it's the carbon footprint of the product. For both of these, you need two things. You need what's called activity data. So that's things like the type of fertiliser you've used, the amount of fertiliser you've used, the cultivation methods that you've used. And in the case of the, of the LCA, obviously, you also need to know the yield of the crop because that's what you're dividing the emissions per hectare by uh, however many tonnes you've produced. Um, and uh, the second thing that you need then is an emissions factor, and there are various options for emissions factor. The, the basic level is a tier one international default value, but you can produce more precise uh, carbon footprints by either using tier two or tier three uh, values, which are national, fig national figures, or then even more detailed where you need to model it. But I think the point is that as you produce a more precise uh, um, emissions factor, you also need more activity data to go with it, okay? And I'm not going to go through all the emissions factors and bore you with a heap of numbers, but these are just some of the ones, and these are particularly related to the, to the nitrous oxide emissions, the on-farm nitrous oxide emissions. So uh, for chemical N application, you've got uh, uh, CAN or NPK at the top. We have national figures for these work that uh, we've done in Chagas over the years, has established how much of the nitrogen you apply is, is, is emitted. So in the case of CAN, it's 0.35% of the N. If we were to use the international default, that would be 1% of the N. So our emissions from CAN are about a third of, of what they would be. But also to point out then, there are emissions associated with the nitrogen in crop residues or the uh, emissions from the uh, nitrogen in organic materials, and we don't have uh, local national emissions factors for those, so we have to use in our calculations the tier one factor. Uh, that's obviously something we're going to need to do more research on because I suspect, and I think most people suspect, that those figures uh, are significantly higher than they will be in reality in Ireland. Now, normally for an LCA, you're counting the emissions associated with producing something, and you'll all have heard of offsetting, uh, or in this case, it's insetting because it's within the system. You don't normally include them in the, in the LCA, but we've, we've, we've included in that we can add them into the calculations. So this is the amount of CO2 per hectare that's sequestered if you incorporate the straw. And this is assuming a straw yield of four tonnes a hectare. And you can see that if you're on light soils, you'll, you'll, uh, of that four tonnes, uh, you'll, you'll sequester just under a tonne of, of CO2 into the soil, whereas if you're at the other end on a heavy clay soil, it'll be about twice that, at just over two tonnes. So we've incorporated that into the calculations. And what we've done is we've run through some of the data from Dermot's rotational experiment that Jack and Dermot uh, mentioned earlier, and this is five years of data from 2016 to 2020. So I'm just going to go through some of that very briefly with you. So these are the calculated carbon footprints uh, for each of the crops in the rotation. Uh, you've got the rotational crops there from uh, left to right, and then uh, the last two columns on the right-hand side 
compare winter wheat grown as part of the rotation or continuous winter wheat, and these for the plough-based cultivations. And you can see the continuous winter wheat has a slight, slightly higher carbon footprint. That's because it has slightly higher nitrogen uh, rates applied and also because it's slightly lower yielding. And just looking at the, uh, the, what contributes to that carbon footprint of the wheat, you can see on the, on the right-hand side is the, is the carbon that's embedded in the fertilizer we use, and that's accounting for nearly half of the total CO2 emissions for our crops. And then uh, the lighter green slice um, is, the, is the emissions that are associated with applying the fertilizer, not the diesel for the tractor, but what comes off when you actually apply the nitrogen to the soil. And that's about another 24%. So about three quarters of the emissions uh, associated with wheat production are to do with nit uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Fuel production and use, so that's uh, obviously uh, tractors, machinery for harvest, and about 14%. Crop residues there, it comes in the calculation at about 10%. As I said, we don't have local emissions factor, so I think that's pos possibly uh, over, um, overestimated. Uh, seed is about 3% and crop protection is about 1%. So that's the embedded carbon in, in crop protection products that you would apply. So in, in Dermot's experiment, uh, he obviously has the cultivation methods, uh, and this is the, the, the CO2 emissions for those crops either grown using uh, shallow minimum tillage or ploughing, and you can see there's not really much difference between the two. Uh, that's because although you're using slightly less diesel in the minimum tillage uh, compared to the plough, when you look across these five years that we looked at anyway, there's a tendency for the minimum tillage to be slightly lower yielding. So the two things offset each other and overall the carbon footprint is, uh, is very similar. So as I mentioned, we've built in the ability to account for, for carbon sequestered by the straw if you incorporated the straw. Now in Dermot's experiment, he didn't incorporate the straw, but we've done the calculations for what would happen had he incorporated the straw. So this is the uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per tonne of grain produced uh, and that would be sequestered if you incorporated the straw from winter wheat, winter oilseed rape, winter oats and winter barley. And you can see there's a, there's a higher straw yield on the winter oats, so you're sequestering more carbon. And the, the other, at the other end of the range, there's winter oilseed rape. So we can now superimpose that over the emissions for those crops. Um, so in brown is the gross emissions that I showed you earlier uh, for four of the crops, and in green is the net. So that's what's left after you've accounted for the carbon sequestered in the straw. And you can see there for winter oats, if you can account for the carbon sequestered in the straw, you're getting very close to, to uh, zero uh, in terms of the emissions uh, that are left after carbon sequestration. So just to conclude, uh, nitrogen fertilizer use and yield are the main factors affecting carbon footprint. We need to do further uh, research to refine, refine some of the emission factors where we're currently having to use tier one figures. The carbon footprint of Irish grain is low by international standards. Given that we have some of the highest yields in the world, that's not surprising. Um, and you know, we're hoping or what this will do uh, once, once we can apply it is it'll be an, an, it's an endorsement of the sector's credentials to stakeholders in the value chain. So people buying uh, grain, um, you know, they can see that, what that what's being produced on Irish farms is of low environmental impact. And also then I need to just uh, make sure to thank Turlon, uh, who put in significant funding for the development of this LCA model. And apologies to anyone from that company who's here if I couldn't get my English accent around your na new name, but it's your fault for coming up with something that's hard to uh, pronounce when you have an English accent. Okay, so thanks very much, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, John. Okay, so delighted to welcome Sinead Morris now from SETU, Southeast Tech University. So Mark mentioned in his talk uh, about the potential from Sprint Brewers Grain, and Sinead is talking about exciting work that we're doing in collaboration with themselves. Off you go, Sinead. Perfect. So I am going to talk about a DAFM funded project between Chagas TUD and SETU Carlo Campus named Dabbing Copper Distilling and Brewing Building Capacity. And in this, I'm going to specifically focus on what is SETU's role. So up until recently, we only really had standard methods for testing malted barley for alcohol yield. Um, and as a push to try and get more distillers to use crops like wheat, rye, and maize, we now need new methods that mimic Irish industry standards for determining alcohol yield on a small scale. 
So the first thing, or the first role for ICTU was to develop these lab scale methods. So we take small amounts of grains and we can put them through an alcohol yield process to determine predicted spirit yields or alcohol yields. From there, we know that things like protein are going to have massive impacts on alcohol yield. So we wanted to start looking at kind of analysing the protein, starches, and then any other kind of grain composition that's going to impact on that kind of final alcohol yield. And then after that, it's putting all that information together to see can we come up with suitable characteristics that's going to deem these grains suitable for within the Irish distilling sector. So looking in particular to wheat, why would we want to use wheat? So wheat has the potential to replace imported maize within our Irish distilleries. It is suitable or very suitable to our crop. It's a high yielding crop. And with that, we also have numerous experienced growers that can produce a very good crop for us to use and it gives very good alcohol production. So in terms of kind of what alcohol we're expecting, we're expecting over 410 litres of alcohol per tonne of grain on a dry basis. There are concerns with wheat. We've hard and soft wheat. So some wheat is hard like Costello and it's perceived as having a lot of difficulties by Irish distillers. And then we have soft wheats like LG Astronomer that are seen to be easier to process, but still also have their own concerns in terms of their suitability to our climate, but issues then within that production process. In terms of processing issues that we see in production is high levels of protein can reduce our alcohol content. Um, having too much pentasans will give us increased viscosities, which will lower our alcohol yield. Um, so the main aim here is to try and figure out how does all those grain compositions like the protein and the starch impact alcohol production and impact a distiller's decision to use these crops. So kind of looking at some of the results that we're seeing, and I'm going to focus on protein at the moment. So protein is a major element um, in terms of making alcohol. We know for malted barley it needs to be between certain ranges. And up until recently, we didn't know what that was going to be for wheat. So in this graph here, this is what has been previously reported in other jurisdictions, in particular from Scotland. So in Scotland, they predicted that as you increase grain protein, so grain protein is on the x-axis, alcohol yield is on the y-axis, as the grain protein increased, you lost alcohol, um, and lost at a rate of about 7.2 litres um, of alcohol per tonne of grain, which is a substantial amount to be losing. From our studies, we've seen something completely different. So again, protein along the x-axis, alcohol yield on a dry weight basis along the y-axis. And what we've seen is that as we start to increase that protein levels, we get this kind of spike before it starts dropping off. What we can say from that is we were predicting that we need about 8 to 11% protein within our grain in order to achieve really high alcohol levels. So with high alcohol levels, we're talking 4 to 500 litres of alcohol per tonne of grain. Protein, obviously, is just one element that we need to look at. The other major element that we need to look at is the starch concentration, or how much starch is present in the grain. More starch, more sugars, more alcohol. So I suppose to first start with, how does N-rate impact on that starch? So our samples were provided from a trial from Chagas that looked at various N-rates being applied to the wheat. We took those samples um, and calculated how much starch was present. As the N rate increased, we got an increase in starch, up until about 200 kgs of N. As it went to 250, it kind of plateaued off and we kind of reached our maximum starch amount. So we're looking at anywhere from 60 to 80% starch in Irish wheat, um, with about 8 to 10% protein. How does that impact on alcohol yield? Well, the more starch you have, the more sugars you have. If you have more sugars, the yeast can ferment it and give higher levels of alcohol. So what we see here, is that as um, starch on the x-axis, alcohol yield on the y-axis, we get a nice linear straight line so that as we increase that amount of starch in the grain, we get higher alcohol yields. So to kind of conclude around starch, we need around 200 kgs of N per hectare to get really high levels of starch in the grain, have a nice low level of protein. Starch increases, alcohol um, increases. The kind of main thing with this is, this has all been done on a lab scale. We now need to move forward to a proof of concept and that needs to be done on a pilot scale facility. So at this point, I will pass these over to Lisa Ryan, who's gonna talk about Chagas's role. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, my name is Lisa Ryan. I am the manager of the National Centre for Brewing and Distilling in Oak Park and Carlow. Um, and the aims of this centre um, are to develop with academic and industry partners a domestic centre of excellence for brewing and distilling 
that validates the added value potential for Irish grains for malting, brewing and distilling. Um, we want to support education and training uh, in, the, in the industry, um, allow the, the industry, the drinks industry themselves to come in and, and rent the centre so that they can do their, their trials on site. So that's allowing them to do a trial at a lower cost and a lower risk. So if it goes badly wrong, it doesn't cost them some production. Um, so essentially, they can come into the centre and, and rent it and do their trials. And obviously, we're working very closely with SETU and Sinead and her team um, on the, the wheat piece and, and optimising Irish grains. Uh, just the photograph on your left there is um, the pilot malting plant in Oak Park. So that allows us malt 250 kg batch sizes at a time. It takes about seven to eight days to put that through the system. And on the right hand side there of the screen is a micro malting plant. So that allows very small scale batches. So that just allows you to scale up in terms of your numbers of samples through. So the center has been up and running, I suppose, since, well, I started last, this time last year, really. Um, and what we focused on really is, is the education and training piece. So we have a joint um, strategy with SETU. So SETU were the first university in Ireland to have the honours degree program in brewing and distilling. So their students will come into, into, into our centre and do a lot of their, their work, their classes and some, some of their project work as well. Um, so we're working very closely with SETU in terms of designing training courses for the industry as well. So we've, we've four or five courses that, that the industry need and we will be certifying them through, through SETU. Um, there's QC training available for industry partners as well, and we're looking at expansion uh, in the centre for phase two um, and installing uh, another column still. So what you'll see there on the pictures is a pot still, so that allows us to distill 60 litres uh, of beer in there. Um, we have a column still, a small column still as well, and the picture there to the right was the first distillate that came off the column, and the hydrometer is sitting there in the, in the water in the front, or the alcohol, and that's telling you that it's at 85% ABV. So then for 2024, the plans are to develop the analytical laboratory further. So done a lot of work on the lab um, and we've a few more bits of kit that we need to get in there. So good progress being made there and we've a sensory room set up for the industry to use as well. We'll continue with the on-site technical support work um, for new startups. So busy last year with, with a couple of new distilleries getting started up and looking for some support. Um, and there was a couple of existing businesses as well who looked for some training and support on site. So that we'll just continue to deliver that. Um, in terms of research then, again, we're looking at a few interesting areas there. So investigating the benefits of fermented non-alcoholic beer on human health. So we're, we're, we're supporting that, that research. Um, distillery waste optimization, again, it's a huge opportunity in terms of uh, the waste products that come off the different processes of distilling. So uh, pot ale would be one of those, and for every one litre of alcohol produced, eight litres of pot ale is produced, um, and there's about 14, 15% protein in that, so we're looking at that with SETU. Um, we're also looking at trying to expand the utility of Irish grains and bringing added value to the tillage sector, and that's a big piece of, of, of work, and it's really focusing in around Irish pot still whiskey. So, it's the only whiskey that's unique to Ireland, Irish pot still, and it's a unique recipe to Ireland, so no other country produces it. And currently, the recipe allows for 30% barley to be used in that, in that recipe. So there's a, there's a challenge on, on the regulations around that to allow more Irish grains to be used in there. So we just really want to get ahead on that in terms of optimising that process. We're working with SETU on that, so that's a, that's a big opportunity. Um, and we're also looking at malting characteristics of heritage barley varieties. And that's me. Okay. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Lisa. If you want to join us over here, please. And again, please, attendees, if any questions, just send them in through the, through the Slido app as well. So um, I have lots of questions, and I think we, we have a good few coming through the panel. John, I'm, I'm going to start with yourself, because we've heard so much about carbon footprinting. Uh, carbon impact, carbon sequestration, etc. I suppose the first thing is, where does tillage rank? relative to dairy and beef sectors? Well, that's looked at in the um, National Farm Survey sustainability report um, each year. Uh, and that, I must point, that's using the IPCC methodology, obviously, for the national inventory. And tillage emissions per hectare are low. They, they obviously vary a bit from year to year. In terms of the tillage element, it's somewhere in around 1, 1.3 tonnes a hectare. 
beef would be about four tons a hectare, and dairy is more like dairy is more like eight or nine tons a hectare in terms okay. of their emissions. Okay. And you talked on your your pie chart about fertilizer manufacture. It's huge. I mean, the impact of that is huge. So, is there any way that can be reduced? So, what we've used in there is the is a is a an emissions factor for for fertilizer manufacture which is the European average. So it's the average of all the fertilizer that's used in Europe, which is 3.7 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of N produced. There's huge variation in that. If you went to some of the most advanced fertilizer factories uh, in, in Western Europe, you could about halve that figure to something like 1.8. Mm -hmm. And at the other extreme, then if you went over to Eastern Europe or China, where they have some very inefficient fertilizer plants running on, on coal, then that figure could be as high as 9 or 10 rather okay. than the 3.7. So if you made sure on your tillage system and you could verify it, and that's mm. the point about the activity data, that you were only buying fertilizer from efficient plants, you could about halve that, that, that side of the, of the pie chart. Pie chart. Okay, very good. Mark, the, there's, there's a question there at the top, but before I take that one, I suppose there's an awful lot of hype about plant protein, to be honest. Um, I mean... You know, is, is, it going to, is it going to materialize? We heard this morning, you know, very difficult scenarios for farmers here at the moment. They're looking to put in more uh, protein crops. Is there going to be extra value opportunities down the line? Yeah, that's a relevant question. I suppose the first thing is to distinguish between, because people get a bit confused in, in plant-based products and plant-based ingredients. Plant-based ingredients, maltodextrin and thing has been around for a long time. The starches have been around for a long time, but they're commodities. Uh, but when you valorize the entire plant and you take the protein out as well, um, it, it's much more, it becomes much more competitive. So the ingredient market is much bigger. So the hype around the plant, yes, you hear meat products and so on failing and, and so on. But, you know, I don't think Ireland is going to be, our goal is going to be replicate meat using plant. That's not. But what we do well is, is ingredients. And we understand the functionality. We have a huge infant formula sector and so on. So we understand formulations and so on. So it's the ingredient space okay. that we're talking, which is a more global market. So then taking that answer to that question at the top there, would it be a yes? Can we replicate it? Can we replicate the success of the dairy? Um, we can, but um, currently, do we have to be careful what I say, do we have the infrastructure to do it at the moment? Probably not. Okay. Um, we have a lot of it, though, because you're talking about huge investment. Mm. And we have the expertise. We have the expertise, and we do have the dryers and, uh, and membrane technologies and so on, but there is some more to be added to, to valorise it. Again, it's back to being able to... We want to skip forward. Mm. We just don't want to take the protein out. We want to take the protein, the starch, the fibre, the things that are all in one go. Every bit. Skip what it took dairy to do maybe 40 years. Yeah, very good. OK, John, the top question there. Where does the difference in our can emission factor in Tier 1 systems come from? Big difference? Uh, it, it is a big difference. I'm, I'm glad to say it comes from some, some very good science that's been published, uh, which is how we have it in the National Inventory. Uh, and I think the point is, with any of these emissions, uh, CO2 emissions, they're very uh, dependent on uh, the climate and the soils in which you're farming. Um, and we tend, to have, we tend to have our tillage on lighter land in Ireland, which, and that's not as biologically active, and that means you get lower emissions of nitrous oxide from applying fertilizer. Uh, so the tillage factor is 0.35 for CAN, the tier one factor is one, the factor for grassland this island is 1.4. So we actually have more than average emissions on grass from can on grassland, okay. which is why there's a big push to use protected urea on yeah. grassland. Okay, very good. Sinead, um, your presentation obviously has lifted the lid on the potential of, of wheat, and obviously winter wheat is one of our main crops. We grow it very well, we produce really high yields. Um, but the obvious question then is why aren't well, why isn't it mainstream? Why isn't it being used to offset maize imports, etc.? What, what are the challenges with it? So I suppose one of the main challenges is not understanding the full grain composition. So different elements of the grain composition, like beta-glucans or pentasans, have a huge impact on the production process. So the increased things like viscosity, and if we get increased viscosity, we don't get even conversion of starch to sugar, which lowers our yields. Um, and then with that, it kind of can put some downtime onto the distillery. If it's too thick, it causes more time to clean it out. 
Um, and it just, we kind of, I suppose we need more research into trying to utilize wheat within the sector to try and figure out what varieties are going to be the best ones, I suppose is the first thing. And then figuring out like what the protein levels, what the starch levels need to be to try and kind of mimic what we already have for malted barley. Yeah, very good. And Lisa, I mean, the center, as you said, it's only 12 months really getting going, it's getting up on its feet, but it's, it's a good segue from the work in dabbing cap, but from your end, are, is there interest from the industry, you know, specifically in like winter wheat and other aspects? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, yes, there are challenges in terms of getting the industry to, to buy into this and to, to change. It's a hugely successful industry, and if it's, if it's not broken, why fix it? So there's a little element of that approach. Um, but, uh, but I certainly, in my own experience, worked in a distillery where we used um, imported French maize and we changed over to using Irish wheat. And while there were, were processing issues, it was all very doable and it's very successfully run now. So where the centre comes in is to enable Sinead's trials to be scaled up and then to invite the industry in and, and say, listen, this is Irish wheat, this is what you need to do to get this yield out of it. So, um, yeah, we're at the early stages, but that's, that's the goal. Right, so, I mean, it's, it's basically a, a, an incubation platform for budding businesses that are, are starting out. So, I mean, the last question there, any potential in micro-malting on farms? I mean, that's an open-ended question. Yeah, so um, there's loads of potential, huge potential there. Um, so we have a micro-malting facility in, in Oak Park, and if, if somebody needs support on, on that process, uh, give me a shout, um, I, I can help you out. But yeah, there's, there's massive potential there. Right. So John, lots of specific questions in regards to the carbon. The top one there, um, impact of ploughing, has it been counted in? There's been quite a lot of work done, particularly on Dermot's systems trial over the years and on other experiments that we've done comparing ploughing and non-inversion tillage. Mm -hmm. I should say it's, it wasn't particularly direct drilling at the time. And whilst if you look at the, the international data, and particularly places like Canada and Australia, if you plough the soil, you lose huge amounts of carbon the more you disturb the soil. But they're in hot, dry climates, and that carbon burns off very quickly. Mm -hmm. What we find in our conditions, uh, which are far from hot and dry, um, is that you don't burn off anywhere near as much carbon from ploughing compared to, to non-inversion tillage, as you would in, in other climates. So in, in terms of Irish-specific data, the difference between ploughing and non-inversion tillage, or minimum tillage anyway, is relatively small. But what was also found was that those nitrous oxide emissions from applying fertiliser tended to be slightly higher on minimum tillage, and that offset the difference in carbon. So we, have, we don't have data to support putting it into a model, uh, so it's not in there. Okay, okay, fair enough. Sinead, you, you obviously talked about wheat. Have you done any work on rye or any other cereals? Yes, yeah, so we currently have ongoing work being carried out on rye. So we're in the alcohol yield process for rye, and then we're doing the same for maize. Once we've kind of determined the alcohol yield potentials for them, we'll move on to characterizing the grain compositions and then applying all that same stuff that we've done on wheat to both of those two crops and, as well. And repeat the process. Yep. Yeah, very good. Mark? The bioavailability of plant proteins versus dairy meat proteins. How better are plant proteins? By looking at dairy, as we know, you know for years, is, is a, I suppose from a nutritional point of view, it's designed for animals. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the bioavailability of the minerals and so on. There's a publication just come out to show clearly is better from a mineral point of view. Come with it. Uh, a lot of work being done on the on the digestion of the plant proteins now. But the interesting thing, if you take what the AB and Bev have done. Um, even though the amino acid profile may not be as, as balanced in the barley as, as a dairy, it's still good and it has a leucine content, you need leucine to produce muscle protein. So it depends on the application, of course. but you need leucine for muscle, so it actually works very well there. So, they, you know, the potential is there. Yeah. The potential is there, okay, yeah. Great. Lisa, there's a, an interesting question there about potatoes. Yeah, I see that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Have we looked at it yet? No, um, but it's it's definitely has potential. So um, it's it's one of it's one on the list of us to, to, to do, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. And John, carbon offset from straw incorporation, a once off, or is it a cumulative year after year? Uh, it's not a once off. Generally, when you change your your system, um, it, it will take somewhere like twenty five or thirty years to equilibrate. So if you started incorporating straw today, your soil carbon would continue to increase for about 25 or 30 years and then it would level off at a higher point. Okay. So um, you're banking it's, it, it, it's not year. Hmm? you're banking it year on year. You're banking it year on year but it will level off in about 30 years time. Okay. So it's certainly not a one-off 
Uh, can you achieve it year after year? You can do it long enough for me to not worry about it too much in 30 years' okay. time. And, and why does oilseed rape have, have a much higher footprint? Just because it's lower yielding. I mean, the oilseed rape in that trial was probably yielding about five tonnes a hectare, so you're dividing the total emissions per hectare just by a lower yield. But don't forget, I mean, oilseed rape obviously has a much higher energy content mm -hmm. per tonne than cereals would. So you can work these things out various ways. You could look at the, you know, you, you can look at the carbon footprint per unit of protein or per unit of energy. Yeah. We've just done it there in terms of straight tons, but a ton of oilseed rape is not the same as a ton of barley, obviously. Okay, okay. Mark, you, you obviously a lot of the talk is around faba bean, um, and I should say uh, to attendees, if, if you want to know more detail and more information, obviously the, the plant protein stand is out there, but also there's other stands um, in regard to Stephen Kilday's work around IPM and Louise McNamara, who's not here today, and grass weeds. So please, please take the time to engage with, with the staff and students out there. Mark, the, it's all about faba bean, but you know, within those projects, there's other crops as well. You mentioned lupin and, and pea. Yeah, yeah, lupin work very well. Sorry, lupin work very well as well. Yeah. Uh, chickpea works well. Um, we've looked at oats, we've looked at barley, um, pea as well. Some of them not as soluble. Okay. Um, so one of the you know, they must be soluble once you produce a powder out of them. Uh, not as soluble, so that's something to be worked on. Uh, but uh, we've also looked at tubers. So even things like mashua, aka, yakon, and so on with, with the eutonics. So the some unusual ones. tubers. Yeah, very good. John, uh, just to tie into Jack's comment earlier, you know, in terms of directorial systems, um, carbon footprint potential to be lower? Um, well, I'll give Jack the LCA model, and once he's done his economics, he can, he can work on the uh, carbon footprint. I mean, uh, the, the carbon going into the system will be lower if you're using less fuel and if you reduce your fertilizer. But obviously then you're dividing by the yield, and Jack showed that the yield on those systems was slightly higher, so it would depend on the balance as to how much you'd reduce the carbon emissions and how much you'd reduce the yield. And I can't say now how that would work out, but if you've, you've obviously got a smaller figure to divide those total emissions by. Okay. But I'm sure... Jack. Once Jack has all the data together, he will, he'll enlighten us in the future. No pressure, Jack. So, uh, Lisa, you mentioned in your talk there about the education. So, I mean, it's not just about the pilot processing and scaling up from Sinead's work. But when you say education, who wants to be educated? Like, where, where's the demand and, and what's so, needed? So, yeah, there's a huge demand for, for training and upskilling. Um, and we have 40 odd di distilleries in the country now and over 70 breweries. And a lot of the staff there um, don't have any experience in brewing and distilling. And so it's the, it's the basics around how to optimize their process and, and get the most out of it. So there's huge, huge, uh, there's huge um, requirement for, for training for, okay. for those people. Yeah. Great. John, I'm going to throw the top question to yourself while there's a lot of focus on drinks. Milling wheat in Ireland. I know we're, we're doing work on it in Oak Park. We're in year three of a trial this year now. But Okay, so uh, the reason we focused on the drinks industry in particular, apart from it being a huge export market for us, is that for alcohol production, as Sinead has pointed out, is you need high starch and relatively low protein. Okay, We have a limited amount of nitrogen that we're allowed to uh, apply to our wheat crops, uh, you know, as part of the nitrates directive, and we have the highest yields in the world, which means we tend to produce high starch, low protein. Most of the milling wheat that we use in Ireland is is put through what's called the Chaldy Wood process to, you know, to produce a Pat the Baker or a Brennan sliced pan, and that needs high protein, and it also needs uh, a low Hagberg falling number. And to get a low Hagberg falling number, which is low alpha amyl amylase activity, um, then you need dry conditions before and during harvest, okay? So I guess my view has been we stand more chance of succeeding getting Irish grains into a high-value drink market than we do developing a large milling uh, process in Ireland. That said, for small producers, say producing brown bread, um, you know, high-value brown bread, traditional brown bread, then we can produce a certain amount of wheat to go into that, but yeah. the very large market, and I, th and I believe it's about 80% of the market, is for that sliced pan, yeah. Yeah. and we're going to struggle. Okay, and I think the last two years would, would highlight that. 2022 was a fantastic harvest weather, and 2023 was, well, we best not, best not think about it. So um, we're going to end the session there. I want to thank Lisa, Sinead, John, and Mark. Um, a round of applause, please, for their contributions.